they say in space, no one can hear you scream, but they can hear you when you promote new alien movies. Entertainment Weekly hosted the New York premiere of the Ridley Scott film Alien Covenant, and EW writer Sarah Bokomerson was on the scene. She sat down with cast members Michael Fassbender, Katherine Watterson, Danny McBride, and Billy Crudup to discuss this sci-fi fright fest. Take a look. Uh, welcome to the Alien Covenant screening. We're so lucky to get to see it a little bit early. Um, so we have members of the cast here, so I want to bring them out. Uh, first up, we have Michael Fassbender. <laughs> Catherine Waterston. <laughs> Billy Crudo. <laughs> and last but not least, Danny McBride. Guys, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's always weird to do this before people see much. the movie, you know. Um, so I, I sort of wanted to start since all of us up here were either very young or not alive when Alien came out in 1979. Not alive. Show of hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> no, I'm curious about how each of you came to. When was your first time that you saw? Do you remember the first time you saw Alien? I'm not going to steal your line on that one. Um, I, I think I was about 12. That's um, young, no? Pretty young, yeah. I think it was punishment for my parents. I'd been misbehaving. Um, I just remember being totally transfixed, terrified, and mesmerized, and trying not to show that fear to my parents so I could stay to watch the rest of it. Um, yeah, it's just one of those films that, you know, even you know, when you're that young, you realize you're watching something... Uh, um, pretty special, about as young as this gentleman in the front row, perhaps. No, you're older. Eleven. Eleven, perfect oh. age. Love it. Oh, boy. <laughs> You'll probably end up in show business. I saw it when I was ten, one scene, and it messed me up, so... <laughs> yeah, I was scarred, eleven, and I uh, made the mistake of sneaking in and seeing a piece of it and left, and, um, yeah, haven't been well. Since. <laughs> I was two the first time I saw it. Uh, it's a tough guy, yeah, tough preschool. Made a huge impact on me. Uh, <laughs> you just like the filmmaking. Right? Yeah, I thought that I instantly saw that Ridley was a visionary at two. I was like, this guy, he's going somewhere. But, Daddy, you love, I know you love the genre so much. So, like, this is Ridley Scott in space, this franchise. I can't imagine how exciting it is as an actor to get called for that. Yeah, it's nuts. I mean, uh, yeah, it's like the first time I get the call for it, I'm, the part of me is like, well, that's crazy that he wants me to be in this. And then the other part is like, I don't want to ruin the franchise by being in this movie. Um, Bird is in the front row. Could you watch the language? I said fudge. I said fudge. Come on. <laughs> oh, wait till you see the There's stuff a lot Catherine worse says in the film. <laughs> but no, it's incredible. And like to work with Ridley and then to work with Ridley on an alien movie, you know, a franchise he started. Uh, yeah, it's unbelievable. I don't know how much people here know about Ridley Scott as a filmmaker, but he really cares about practical sets. And so I really wanted to hear what it was like to be, you guys were in Australia and New Zealand. And how, what is it as an actor, to, like what kind of benefit? Because I know he's so artistic and he draws everything, but it's important to him too that there's a physical reality to it as well. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, he just loves filming. And I think, you know, coming, f you know, he's seven years studying art um, you know, w w with people like David Hockney and then went on to be a graphic designer. And, and so he brings all of that to his, his, his workplace in terms of, you know, the, the film sets. And obviously for, for an actor that's very rare these days, especially for these kind of movies, it's usually green screen, special effects added in later. But, you know, Ridley's thinking about lots of things. He goes, well, it's much cheaper. He goes, you know, I can build a set for $140,000 uh, as opposed to spending two hundred and fifty dollars doing the special effects on it. But I think it's because he actually just likes the interaction with these sets. You know, it's like walking on an art installation. I think you, you, that was the way you called it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, the, the people that he hires uh, to make his creepy-ass world come alive are... <laughs> the phenomenal artisans and to see them create something with uh, the kind of resources that they have um, is a pretty 
cool thing to be a part of. I mean, the spaceship, Danny and I would sit on and try to just keep ourselves composed and be like, oh my God, we're on the alien spaceship. We're on the alien spaceship. <laughs> well, we get kicked off if we get caught taking selfies of ourselves. Yes, put the phone down, Danny. <laughs> That's true with even some of the creatures that people will be seeing soon. Like they were actually made and sort of actually creepy, right? Genetically made yeah. and uh, <laughs> disposed with after the film, Absolutely. you know, like any good actor should be. <laughs> what about? What was that, Catherine? <laughs> Sorry. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> What about the like ship that they saw is on a gimbal or something, the movement of it? Is, is it hard to be on something like that? It's awesome. I mean, the day that, when I read the script, the, there's, like, there's a scene you'll see where there's like a, a smaller spaceship that, that comes to the surface at one point. And uh, in the script, I, was, I had no idea how that would be filmed or what they would do. And you show up to the set, and it's like really, he really built the ship for real. <laughs> it's on a gimbal, and it's going up and down in the air. And you're just like, wow, I'm just strapped into this for a week, just getting to fly in this machine. It's a, it, it was pretty wild. Yeah, it doesn't leave anything to the imagination, really. You just get to sit in and hold on, and then just hope that, the, that you're in focus, I guess. <laughs> And what kind of training did you guys have to do? I know, Catherine, you had to, to do some like fight training, gun training. Uh, yeah, well, there, there were a few soldiers in the film, and they had, to, they had to do harder things than I had to do. But I was so nervous that Ridley wasn't going to let me do the stunts that there was a sort of fit test at the beginning that nearly killed me, but I didn't want to seem like I, I couldn't handle it because I thought they might take the fun moves away from me. Um, but... It wasn't. Uh, she was fearless. I, to be honest. It was so much fun. I, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't want to seem like some kind of warrior at the beginning of the film because I feel like that journey happens within it. So I didn't want to come in too ripped, but I didn't want to like you know rip my shoulder out of its socket or something. So I did. A, I did a few exercises, but also we. A lot of the training kind of happened on set because we were carrying heavy packs and carrying really heavy guns. And for me, it was heavy, okay? And so I just would do like, you know, curls, bicep you curls. You didn't empty your way. bags out? That's like, you know, yeah. Yeah. I just put paper in mine. Yeah. Was like, <laughs> me too. Styrofoam. Is that why you ran so fast? I had to tackle Billy at one point. Well, and I it did was a weird. year and a half of physical training just in case Captain Aura might need it on set. It wasn't in the script, but you'll know. Inside, if Captain Orm had shown his body, it would be it would ripped. Have been That's right. <laughs> and and there, is, there is that training video you did for the DVD extras. Yeah, yeah, and that's on sale as you guys exit. Not um, safe for work. <laughs> so. Um, I know he, he Ridley shoots so quickly, and I don't know if people know this about him. He, he sometimes shoots four or six cameras at a time, which is unusual, isn't it, I'm assuming? Um, and I know he loves working with theater actors, especially, and I'm, he doesn't even like to rehearse. He, he especially just... likes to work with theater actors. He was telling us Almost that exclusively. when they weren't around. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. He's like, he has to put up with us. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't get any theater actors. They're all in the theater. Sometimes uh, sitcom actors, sometimes. <laughs> but is that fun Sorry. as an actor for it to be that quick and that, that you know, you, don't, you only do, what, three or four takes at the most? I felt like, yeah, he's, uh, all you really want from a director is to make sure uh, that they're in charge, they understand the kind of language that they're using for the storytelling and that you're in the right place. And he's very clear about all of that and when you have your moment, uh, you know, telling Shine. your character's story, exactly, <laughs> you're ready to go. But also he is a perfectionist, he doesn't stop if we haven't gotten it, so it's not I, I suppose you could get yourself into a situation where you felt panicked, like we're gonna, only going to have two takes and then that'll be it. But if it's not good, he's not going to stop. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes... But you've got to come prepared. You know, yeah. that's the great thing. It's like, you know, you can't figure it out on the day. You were saying that earlier, Danny. It's like, you know, you know you're going to be doing two or three takes and he likes to move fast. He gets frustrated, you know, hanging around. It's like... Uh, you have to be on it, so you have to arrive with stuff to bring. And um, and the great thing about I I think you know the first take especially is nobody knows what's going to happen. And so, you know, uh, you know, focus pullers always hate it, but I always go forget about the rehearsal. Let's just go. And they're like, Jesus Christ, the measuring tapes are coming out and stuff because <laughs> it's a bit of a you know it's it, it's hard. But um, it just gets you into a zone where you you're you know there's no downtime. A lot of the times on sets, especially with something of this size. There can be a lot of downtime and a lot of dead air, and you know that sort of gets complacency sets in. Whereas 
because really everyone's on their toes the whole time. It's a very relaxed env environment. But, um, but you know, all, de all uh, departments are, are on their toes, prop department, you know, uh, camera department, uh, the acting department. It's, it's nice energy. He's a good storyteller, too. He likes to tell stories. For sure. Yeah. Um, did any of you, did you manage to not ask him what is happening next after this movie? What happens between now and when we get back to 1979? Um, he told me some things. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> they can't tell us. No. Nope. <laughs> Apparently, I didn't need to know anything. <laughs> Tell us what people should expect now. They're about to start watching this. What should they keep their eye on? You know, I mean, if you're ready to see the best film ever made, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you come to the right place. <laughs> when should this young gentleman cover his eyes, I guess is the, maybe, maybe soon. Yeah, Never. when the lights go out. <laughs> but your ears too, cover, you want to cover everything. <laughs> It's like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we should let everybody see this great movie. Thank you guys so much for Enjoy. being here. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>